Hey guys, so this is going to be a three-part video in androgen receptor overexpression in PFS and PSSD. The first part will talk about what receptors are in general and what regulation for receptors means. The second part is going to be about how this relates to the syndromes themselves. And the third part will be hopefully what we can conclude about all this. Now, keep in mind, none of this information is absolute, and this issue is not fully understood inside in scientific literature, so we know even less about it when it comes to the syndrome specifically. So, first of all, we know through multiple studies that finasteride can create changes in the expression of androgen receptors, and at the same time, we know that androgen receptor overexpression is present in PFS patients. Finasteride was a medication created to specifically inhibit androgenic activity. Adding to that, isotretinoin, which is responsible for PRSD, also affects the function of androgens. Considering these facts, you would expect that this uh, issue would have been investigated further. However, to the best of my knowledge, this does not seem to be the focus of research on the syndromes. Also, keep in mind that although uh, androgen receptor overexpression has been detected in PFS patients, it has not been confirmed in PRSD or PSSD yet. We will continue in this video under the assumption that these conditions are actually identical. So, receptors are what hormones bind to in order to exert their effects. In the absence of an appropriate receptor to bind to, no amount of a hormone circulating in the bloodstream would have any effects whatsoever. Receptor regulation is the concept of these receptors increasing or decreasing in number and potency. Now, receptor regulation takes place in our bodies all the time, even outside of external interference. The menstrual cycle, pregnancy, puberty, and even daily activities like weight training all influence the expression of receptors in our bodies. These changes are most of the time localized. For example, weight training and gaining muscle may increase androgen receptor in the muscle cells, but will not necessarily affect other organs the same way. So, altered receptor expression can mean alter activity of a certain hormone. Now, it's important to know that sex hormones work in context and can have both synergistic and antagonistic effects with one another. Thus, an imbalance in the activity of one hormone can affect the function of other hormones besides creating its own detrimental effects. An out-of-balance hormonal homeostasis can have a significant impact on one's overall health, as sex hormones play a significant part in regulating not only sexual function, but also brain health and cognition, muscle and bone health, cardiovascular health, digestion, and even the immune system. Now, receptor overexpression does not necessarily mean hormonal overactivity. Receptor activity can be intercepted at various points, like binding affinity, sensitivity to agonism, and even after a hormone has already bound to a sensitive receptor. That said, without evidence of further disturbance, it is reasonable to assume that receptor overexpression will correlate with hormonal activity. Outside of specific context or external interference, receptor regulation tends in one of two directions. Receptor agonism will lead to proliferation of said receptor expression. Receptor antagonism, or even just inactivity, will lead to a reduction in receptors. For example, testosterone binds to and activates androgen receptors, which will in turn lead to receptor prol proliferation, meaning the receptor count will increase. Testosterone deprivation, on the other hand, will lead to a decrease in receptor count as the body adapts to a decreased availability of androgens. This is also the reasoning behind hormone deprivation therapy for the treatment of specific sex hormone dependent cancers like breast cancer and prostate cancer. These types of cancers are usually very sensitive to hormonal ligands. For example, breast cancer essentially feeds off of estrogen as it binds to estrogen receptors in the cancer cells and leads to its growth. Prostate cancer usually acts the same with androgens. For this reason, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors and anti-gonadotropics are used to dramatically reduce androgenic presence in the prostate. And aromatase inhibitors, as well as SERMs, selective estrogen receptor modulators, are used to starve breast cancer of estrogens. But it's not always so straightforward. For example, studies, studies have shown in castration in animals that in response to androgen deprivation after castration, what happens is androgen receptors first increase for a short while before eventually falling back down to normal. Also in breast cancers, after prolonged estrogen starvation, studies have shown that ERs, estrogen receptors, can actually turn oversensitive as a response to being entirely starved off of estrogens. Thus being way more sensitive to estrogenic agonism 
and requiring further and more complete elimination of estrogens in order to combat their growth. So there is no guarantee that receptor overexpression signifies a, an overt androgenic activity. It may also signify there's too little androgenic activity and that the body is trying to compensate for it. A very important fact to remember is the localized nature of these changes. Just because we have evidence of androgen receptor overexpression in one part of the body does not mean this finding will be consistent across every other relevant or irrelevant organ. So while there may be too much androgenic activity in one part, there could be too little in another, or it could be entirely unaffected somewhere else. Okay, so that'll do it for the first part of the video. Hopefully everybody has a basic grasp of what we're talking about here, so that what I'm going to talk about in the second part will actually make a little bit of sense. I'll see you in the next video where I'm going to talk about how this relates to the syndromes and what it might possibly mean.